live stream is rolling and the intro music is now going. Also, if you need a refill of coffee at any point, I'm happy to run up and grab the pot. I made enough to last me the day, so I have a fuck ton of coffee available. Sweet players, welcome to the wave. Welcome, my newest brother in the front, Papa Ch Chongo. Chongo. Chongo, yes. beautiful. Welcome Thank home, you. brother. Thank it, you. Absolutely, man. Tell me again where you moved back from. Uh, I moved from Phoenix, Arizona. Cool. Would you mind pulling that mic up to you a little bit closer? Sure. You, you can move that towards you if you'd okay. like as well. It will kind of bend down towards you. Okay. Uh, yeah. How's that? That's perfect. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how long are we in Phoenix? Uh, I was out there for 30 years. That's incredible, man. And you, you're born and raised in Cincinnati, correct? Yes, I grew up in Anderson. So what landed you in Phoenix for the first time? Uh, well, it was kind of a long story. You know, it was kind of a, a checkered childhood. And uh, I had to go away for a while because I got in a little bit of, a tr you know, a little bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. And I had to start over in another city. Um, because of what happened to me, I, you know, it was kind of a long story to get into my, my childhood and traumatic experiences and all of that. But when I got out there, um, I didn't really have anything. I didn't know I could play music. I didn't really know anything about myself because I was adopted and my adopted family kind of, you know, denied my African heritage. So I didn't know really, uh, that I had any African American in me until I was 31 years old. Whoa. And, it, you know, I feel like you have um, you have a skin tone that might elude you to thinking that, but it's like, what what really brought you to the uh, the final understanding of that? Did you like an ancestry thing? Um, ancestry thing, yes. And then, you know, I had other people tell me that. They saw that in me, yeah. you know, just the way that I moved or spoke or played music or whatever. They could just kind of tell that I was mixed. And, uh, you know, if, if you would have said that to me in grade school, I would have denied it. Really? Because that's what I thought was, you know, true. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, you know, revolutionary for me just to be able to embrace my culture and, and who I am. Yeah. And also to find a new light of, um, you know, it, it feels like a, a sense of understanding with the self where for, you know, for being an adopted child, for, for moving around so much, like there's so much self-discovery in all of our lives. But when a lot of your ancestry is laid out in front of you, you can kind of make sense of a lot of that stuff and get on to more of your day-to-day -day present self versus at 31 to kind of have your world turned upside down and have a new understanding of who you are. Yeah. It must have been like, what, was it a relief? Was it shocking? Was it going to take some time? It kind of like proved my point, you know, because I was always drawn to um, the drum, the conga primarily it's just been my passion since the time i was a child you know uh, watching ricky ricardo on television you know i yeah. love lucy kind of thing and then on to the allman brothers and mark quinones and giovanni um from the lp uh galaxy series and you know i just i just love that drum and what was crazy is when i found out who my dad was i had already been playing the congas professionally for 10 years and he was a conga player no way. Yeah. So at, at 31, are you meeting your dad for the first time? He passed away before I got a chance to meet him. Gotcha. So it was just a little bit of conversation here and there on the phone, or what'd you get? Uh, no, it was ancestry information and then talking to his relatives. Cool. I found his brother and his aunt, and you know they were telling me stories about him and all of that. But that's where I get my music uh, inspiration from. And what a weird thing where, like, you know, nature versus nurture is always an odd question. Uh, but to feel called to the instrument and then to find out that you're very much n not only just right, but you're uh, you're in a linear fashion pursuing this thing. You're picking up on someone uh, where they had left off in this life. Yeah, the genetic memory is is real. You yeah. know, I mean, it's the exact same drum out of the out of the whole slew. <laughs> out of all the drums out there, the exact same one, you know. And, and what made you first want to say like, OK, 
I've heard of Ancestry. Why not give it a shot? Did you always have this desire to know a little more? I did, yeah, but I was kind of hesitant because, um, you know, you just hear horror stories about you may not want to know who your parents are. They may not want to know you, and they may already have a life that they didn't tell their spouse about, and you could be disrupting their life and all this, you know, kind of negative stuff. Um, so I just wanted to find out the information. I didn't really want to necessarily reach out to anyone. I just wanted to know who they were. Yeah. And that was when I found out, you know, that he had passed away. But my mom, uh, my biological mother, that's when I found her. And she got me the ancestry yeah. thing for Christmas. That's yeah. so cool. And, and and is she still around? Yeah. Yeah. And what's your relationship? You, you, to, to find yourself close to your biological parent later in life, uh, for as daunting as it may have seemed, and I'm, I'm sure it's a, on a case-by-case basis, would you have any advice for kids that have been adopted about going through that process, mentally preparing for it? Um, you know, it's tough because every case is, is individual. You know, it's not like a one-size-fits-all. You know, I have some family members who were adopted, and, and their parents were drug addicts and criminals and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, you might not want to know. It's really up to you. And, you know, if you want to know, that's fine. Find out for yourself, but don't feel like you have to. You know, yeah. some people are comfortable just not knowing and just forgetting about that whole part of their life and just living in the now. Yeah. Kind of thing. Did that bring you closer to your adopted family going through that and now having a distinction between biological and the the nurture side of things? Um, a little bit, yes, because it really had to, I had to prove my loyalty, you know, because in a way they felt threatened and kind of hurt a little bit that I would seek out people that, you know, gave me up kind yeah. of thing. Um, but it wasn't so much to kind of replace them or to have my, find my parents or anything like that. It was just to, to really know where I came from. Yeah. You know, my lineage on both sides of the, of the family. And when it comes to like the, the deeper ancestry, like where did you find out your family's from? What is your true lineage? Oh, West Africa. Cool. And uh, a little bit of Bolivia, South America. Cool. And then Irish and Scandinavian. It's quite the mix, my brother. Have, Absolutely. Have, have you thought about taking any, um, <laughs> any trips just to see like the, the homes of your, your ancestors? I would love to go to Cuba. Yeah. Yeah, just because that's where the conga originated, and that's where some of the best conga players are from. And I would just love to see, you know, the real heritage of, of where it came from. Yeah, and you said as a kid you ended up on a conga. When was the first time that you remembered seeing the instrument? Well, the first time I remember seeing the instrument was uh, Ricky Ricardo. And cool. I don't think it was a conga. He had kind of like a hand drum that was yeah, underneath this. Like the shoulder you know, sling, yeah. almost like a djembe kind of looking thing. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And then I would play them in the Grateful. I used to follow the Grateful Dead around when I was a kid, and they would have these big drum circles, and there were congas there. So I got a taste of it. But the first time I was really introduced to the conga was Mark Quinones for the Almond Brothers when I saw it live. You know, and how it could sound when he was the the percussionist with the two drummers for the Almond Brothers band. Yeah, and some of the grooves that he would lay down, I just I just love the versatility of it because you can get real high and real low, and it's just a cutting sharp, you know, powerful drum. Yeah, and like we kind of talked about the first time we jammed, it's about finding pockets in between the already established groove. To watch some between two drummers still kind of carve out their lane is a very particular version of that instrument. Yeah. Whereas like with a lot of salsa or bachata or anything in that, that, that Latin category, it is a way more uh, domineering present kind of feel. Versus in the Almond Brothers, it's it's true auxiliary, you know. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's you know, in Latin music, it's like thick polyrhythms. There's like all this really complex stuff going on that's intricate and somehow comes together. You know, all being tied together usually with like the bongo bell or something that's just straight and driving the whole way. But with you know the Almond Brothers band, they've got to play in sync with each other. They're not playing a lot of like hugely opposite stuff. They're yeah. playing almost like synchronized. You know, so they're playing the exact same part just to give it this, you know, audio, this stereo depth. Yeah, and, and what a crazy experience too for like. There's there's something about the way the drums can sound together. Like when when you were seeing the Dead, did the Dead have two drummers at that point in time? Yeah, when I saw them, it was always Mickey and Billy. Cool. And, and how old were you when you first started going with those? I was 16. Okay, that's a super early introduction, man. Yeah, and, and when totally did you, illegal. <laughs> yeah, when did you make the step to go on the road? Uh, as soon as I was 18. Okay, cool. You know, I think even as early as 17, I was taking trips to like Cleveland and Atlanta, um, you know, like a day's drive yeah. to the shows and camping out there. 
And, and was there um, a show in those first two years that really set the tone for I want to do this for as long as I can? It was the first Dead show. No, yeah. just a, a full believer off the bat. It was mind-blowing to me because I'm from a culture of intolerance. You know, like uh, I was raised Catholic and it was a lot of punishment and guilt and, you know, always being made to feel bad. Mm -hmm. You know, not a lot of like respect, a lot of disrespect there, especially, you know, I mean, growing up in an all white family, most of my older relatives were from the old school that were racist. So I heard all of these horrible, like derogatory things and everything was real conflicted between black and white in the 1970s. Yeah. And then here, nobody cares what color your skin is. They just care that you love music. You love music. I love music too. You're my brother. Let's. You know, let's have fun. Let's dance. Yeah. And that's how it went. You know, it was just nothing but love and acceptance at the Dead Show. It was just the biggest family type atmosphere you can ever imagine. Yeah. And, and people get so tied up on the uh, the external elements of partaking in that show. But I think for, for someone that's been looking for that kind of um, welcoming set of arms and in a place free of, of judgment and free of... Um, assumptions about who you are what you are what you're there for to be a 16 year old kid walking into that must be a very different uh, experience of freedom absolutely you know just to not be judged and to be embraced and to feel that love and camaraderie and everybody shares and it's none of this you know it's this is mine and you know everything is just kind of familial yeah and that's kind of how it worked with the drum circles as well because there was this powerful element of the pulse you know, that just kept the drive going and then everybody's dancing and you get the spinners going and the fire burning and it's just like, it's it's amazing, very, very and, powerful. And when you first saw that, were you just walking through Shakedown, you know, your first show beforehand and you saw a drum circle or were you either after the show? It was before and after. Cool. But after is where we really got down. Yeah. <laughs> so when you saw it, before the show for the first time did you immediately sit down and feel called and that was just kind of i'm gonna watch this from a distance and see no i couldn't wait to f see anybody that left a drum i would run up and play it yeah you know i was just a natural tapper as yeah. a kid i was always tapping on my tables and you know trying to play wipe out with my fingers and that, <laughs> i got a little adhd yeah you know where it's hard to sit still and that just gave me a great outlet for that and then I just, it's kind of like a language, you know, like Bapatunde from Africa. He said, if you can say it, you can play it, you know, so you would just say syllables, you know, like Tupac, never say he gone. Tupac, never say he gone. Tupac, never say he gone. And that turns into a rhythm. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of how you can write rhythms and, and pair rhythms together with other people if you're doing drum circles and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great way to communicate non-verbally. And, and so someone would start off by saying a phrase to the group, and then the group would kind of follow and start to splay from that? Uh, in drum circles, yeah, sometimes they would do that. They would just do like a verbal call, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like a call and response kind of thing, or they would just start playing it. Yeah, and then people pick up as it kind of goes. It's almost like a game of telephone in that way as the group reaches the other side of the circle and eventually culminates back to you. Yes. Yep. And did it feel like it have uh, a sense of leadership in that? Or was it more of just the, the group moves as the group moves? It, well, that's where things can derail, you know, because you, you, you want a, a good core group of guys in there that know what they're doing. You know, somebody has to hold down the, the straight pulse of the thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't be soloing all at the same time. Yeah. So there's parts that people have to kind of take on and, and take that responsibility. So there's your bass drum guys that are just going to keep the pulse, whether it's a, a boom, 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 or a boom, 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 whatever it is, just to keep that drive going. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get some of the high end guys that have like, you know, shakers or bells that are going to do different um, you know, rhythms or patterns over the top of that. And then you're going to have your djembe guys that are going to kind of, they can go back and forth because the djembe is one of the most versatile drums out there. You can do bass, real big, heavy, like 808 boom sounds. Yeah. And then you can get your, you know, right on the ends, you can get your real high end sounds. So a good djembe player can hold the bass down and then do some high end stuff in between yeah. that. But everybody has to have some type of discipline and stick to their part. And did you kind of learn the um, the abilities of each of these drums in those circles? Or did you, from that first experience, 
uh, get either a djembe or a conga in your life so you could personally experiment before the next time you went back? Yeah, then I just kind of jumped in head first where I was looking for all kinds of instructional videos. I was trying to find out like who the best players were on the djembe and the conga and the timbali, and I got all those you know, old VHS tapes at those times, you know, so it was like uh, Carl Perazzo and Raul, Raul Rical and uh, Alex Acuna and, uh, uh, you know, Tio Puente just watching his live performances and trying to emulate the things that he did. Yeah. You know, that's pretty much how I learned because I wasn't allowed to play the drums growing up. Like when I was a kid, pots and pans were good. But then once I got older, it was like, you know, time to be quiet and do your homework and there will be no drumming in this house. Yeah. Kind of thing. So I didn't pick it back up. Um, really until I was, you know, like in my late teens is when I was doing the dead thing. And then when I moved out to Arizona, um, that's when I bought my first, uh, percussion rig and I managed to talk my way into this grateful dead band called extra ticket. Yeah. Awesome and, uh, name for a grateful dead band. <laughs> oh, it was yeah. amazing. We had some great times. Vince Welnick from the dead came down and, uh, we sat in with him. Uh, the Smashing Pumpkins came down and they did a little flash mob show before one of our shows. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, it was it was quite an experience. Dave Abair actually um, went on to play with Jerry Garcia Band as the Jerry part. No and, way. Uh, he's now in Steely Dead in Colorado. That's super cool. Uh, yeah. Have you kind of kept up with that entire band? Is that like your first real band that you were part of? Yeah cool yeah that was my first real band don young was the founder he passed away um some time ago but i do keep in contact with evan and uh dave the you know the guitar players and charlie the drummer yeah yeah uh when, when you mentioned that y you feel like you're your adhd is that self-diagnosed do you have a, an actual oh no i was fully diagnosed by a psychiatrist yeah you know <laughs> and for for kids that grew up in a, in a time before you know that diagnosis meant uh, a handful of medication and just trying to get you back to a baseline that's acceptable. Do you feel like there's um, there's an access with you know visceral types of music like congas, like drums that should be more uh, widely utilized by folks in that community? Oh, most definitely. I mean, the, the kids. The reason why kids suffer from ADHD is because they um, have a high ability to process a lot of information at one time. You know, so it can really be a gift if utilized properly. But if they don't have positive outlets for that, then it can become, you know, self-harming or self-detrimental to your success because you don't have a positive outlet for, um, you know, what you were born to do. Mm -hmm. So the trick is finding positive outlets for mental stimulation, you know, keeping your mind busy in a positive way as opposed to just getting into, you know, chewing your nails and pulling your hair and doing all these crazy, like self-soothing things. Yeah. You know, percussion is a great outlet for that because there's all kinds of things going on. You know, you're not just doing like one simple thing. My percussion rig has probably like 20 or 30 different things to hit and make sounds out of. You yeah. Know? And then you got to know when and where to place those and rhythm in the time of the song. So it keeps my whole mind occupied. I'm not thinking about anything else when I'm doing a show. It's yeah. just like, you know, performing and making sure I'm hitting all the parts right. It was playing in that first band one of the first times that you felt fully occupied and in your mental capacity in that kind of a way? Or were there experiences outside of the music that kind of brought that to you? No, it was really all about the show, you know, just playing the communication with the instruments. All I cared about was playing. I did not want to get into all the rest of it. Like, let's just hit the stage and let's start. Yeah. You know, let's jump because that's what they're here for. They're not into They don't want to hear us talk and tell stories and all this stuff. You know, they want to hear the jamming. Let's yeah. get down to it. Absolutely. You know, and that's where the magic happens. You know, when everybody's playing on an emotional level and they're not just like trying to think about the song, they're just feeling it. You know, that's when you can take it to higher levels of consciousness where it just like really affects people in yeah. a positive way. When yeah. there always needs to be that kind of, um, whether it's a mantra or it's uh, an inebriation or it's just an agreed mental space, when, when the whole band starts on a certain plane together and the music can progress into that next state, uh, I feel like that's one of the most magical things that most people that don't play aren't hip to. It's like when you go see high-level jazz, mm -hmm. it's like there's an agreement there that's um, it's a very academic pursuit these days, but in, in a more traditional sense. It's just about folks who want to push uh, what they've been told to play versus what they are going to play. <laughs> right. and, yeah, and how we can 
uh, mend these two schools together. So when you listen to Charlie Parker, you listen to Miles during like the real bebop phases of things, it's like they're not trying to uh, soothe you or impress you. They're trying to stretch their own thoughts of this in a way that only the band's ready to pick up on. And the moment where it hits together is so... Uh, I mean, it, it, it's like the greatest feeling in the world, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, jazz musicians are guys that are just, they're bored with traditional music. It's so simple to them that it's agonizing. Yeah. You know, so they just want to be able to move all around, you know, up and down the instrument and just, you know, have fun with it, always messing with it. You know? Yeah. When I've always <clears throat> uh, described, like, if you're a vocalist and instrumentalist, one is an active thought and the other one's a passive thought. And you're managing these two things at once, um, and and you really can't you really can't split the mind. Uh, have them both go certain ways. One thing needs just to be on recall and be how you do it. And for me, that's more comfortable on guitar. And then the vocal side of this can be uh, the very active you know way that we're moving forward with this. Mm -hmm. there, there's something about the the trance state that comes along with drums or percussion, where I would wonder where that. Where does it become active versus path, passive thought, or is it kind of all embodied? Well, I mean, I think it all works together, but it, it really depends on your approach to music. So, you know, a lot of guys that are just school trained, you know, to where they rely on paper and they've got to be able to follow the notes and they're not really comfortable with moving around their instrument without the notes telling them where to go, that can be inhibiting. You know, mm -hmm. it can also be highly intellectualized to where if you do have that natural ability to move up and down your instrument and then you understand the technical side of it, you know, that opens it up to endless possibilities. Yeah. You know? my, my wife uh, recently brought up that she wanted to try the violin and she was she was like, I was worried about telling other people because they might uh, not support the idea. She's like, and I was worried about telling you because I knew you'd get too <laughs> excited about it. And I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm too excited about it. So we already bought a violin. We're already awesome. next deep in this thing. And she's like, I feel like I have a better ability to play by ear with starting on this instrument than I have with other things. And I, I would wonder how much it makes a difference for when you're beginning on any instrument. You have, you have some kind of experience in the music. You know, for her, it was piano first, then guitar. But in both of those pursuits, she had a very stringent methodology that she was being shown. You know, this is how you read the music. This is what you play. And if you play this, it's wrong. Versus when you're just handed an instrument and your ear tells you to go somewhere and you go there, there's uh, this comfort and this freedom with navigating uh, what's right and what's wrong and what's still okay, even though it's somewhere in between those two. It's like most people write their first song accidentally by fucking up their favorite song, you <laughs> right. know, and then things start to kind of roll from there. Most definitely. I don't really think it's so much a matter of like right and wrong. I mean, there's different approaches, there's different schools or techniques, but it's really about what sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some people that play guitar flat, you know, just plucking it and just make it sound beautiful. But, you know, a classical guitar teacher would say, oh, you're not playing that correctly or, you know, you're not holding it right or so to speak, you know. So it's really a matter of comfort and sound, you know, yeah. and emotion behind it. Well, you know? I've always said that I think folks that find the instrument before they can speak have a different connection to, uh, to the music in the way that allows them to express themselves. Uh, and one of my, my good friends, uh, Nick Mee, and he's also one of the drummers in, in my band, he he found the instrument about three and he was always playing on drum kit and you watch someone that's self-taught eventually find this efficiency of motion to to revise their playing in the way that a teacher would say that is the correct way but you naturally come to these conclusions as well with time because of what you're asking of the instrument and it, it's so fascinating in the ways that like you don't need to start uh, at A with everybody. Some people can start at O and they're going to make their way back. That microphone looks like it's sinking a little bit. Would you mind tightening oh, up that? Right yeah, that. would you mind tightening that knob at the end there? Sorry, I saw that and it's like my least favorite thing to watch is a <laughs> microphone going limp and ended up on top of a, a drum. Uh, he's also the one that played the auxiliary percussion on the, the live album that I had Oh, set. yeah, he's yeah. great, man. Oh, he was monstrous stuff, on that. Well, dude, he, he brought a hell of a battleship, and I was like, okay, we're going to need to have two quadrants of drums, and then everyone else can figure their shit out around that. But it looks like they're taking up the stage. <sighs> a lot of real estate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting the way that um, you don't need to start in the quote-unquote correct place 
to end up in the same place as everybody else of just like, oh, I want to, like we were kind of talking about before, I want to give to the instrument in the way that it gives back. I want to be in the right place where it reciprocates. Uh, if you're familiar at all with Paul Reed Smith, which is a, a fabulous guitar builder that's also just a maniac of a scientist in a lot of ways. He talks about how the guitar is oftentimes a subtractive instrument. If you get on a guitar and you, you pluck a note, is the momentum you're putting towards the string being reciprocated by the vibrations of the string? Mm -hmm. Is it ready to be resonant in that kind of a way? So in the same way that some people might hit a drum and you hit it so hard that you choke the tonality of it versus if you hit it just right, the thing now breathes back towards you. Yes. And it's like your intimacy with the instrument just over time is going to give you the right way to do it. Right. Yeah. It is a feel thing. That, Absolutely. For sure. Well, with that being said, you want to do a little jamming? Sure. Let's get something sexy rolling.
That was grooving, man. Nice, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's so nice to have friends that are just cool with a very aimless jam, you know. It's like, <laughs> right? uh, it. I find it really comforting as well when you can have someone that's handling the chordal side, someone that's handling the percussive side. So there's no, there's no points of contention here. There's not much we really need to agree on or disagree on. It just can kind of flow together in yeah. that. Yeah. What do you got going on Saturday? I haven't thought that far ahead. Cool. I kind of live in the now. <laughs> I, I dig that, man. And has it been refreshing to make the move back to Cincinnati so that you don't need to be scheduled in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, it's actually been a huge relief. Yeah. You know, a tremendous amount of stress taken off, for what? sure. And you had told me a little bit about your, your business while you have mm-hmm. been out in, in Phoenix, correct? Yeah, it was a big business. I uh, I was on one and a half acres I had five full-time employees. Uh, I'm, I'm a dog trainer by trade, so this was a boarding and uh, daycare and dog training business. Uh, so we were averaging about 25 dogs a day, which is a tremendous amount of energy yeah. and work you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, upwards to 45 to 65 dogs for the holidays, we would be that full. And then after COVID, with the travel ban and the quarantine, um, that tanked my business. That was like 70% of my revenue for months. You know, people were scared to come out of their homes and not traveling. Yeah. And my overhead was about $12,000 a month that I had to just make just to exist. Yeah. And then that was gone. So I decided, you know what, I think it's time to go home. I've been out there for 30 years and I want to be closer to family. And I knew it was going to happen eventually you yeah. know, where I was going to come home. So I figured, well, why not make it my choice? You know, don't wait for something tragic, you know, like mom or dad's sick or yes. you know, death in the family or something like that. Just make a positive thing out of it, you know. So I'm that, just starting my dog training business over here. That's an incredible sentiment to make where it's like everyone can kind of feel that change is coming. That, that I'm going to be called to do something here that I, I don't necessarily want to do. Or I may not be uh, looking forward to every aspect of it. But um, to change your perspective of the thing and to make it a positive, to take control of that, uh, allows you to be such a more joyful participant in it. And, and I, you seem like a person that has uh, a strong will to stay optimistic, to stay positive. And, and that's a choice. You know, no one, no one wakes up that ready for... Um, seeing life in that kind of light uh there are good days and there are bad days but on the Mm -hmm. bad days if you can lean yourself towards the side of i see good things coming down the path for me and i'm gonna do the things in the middle of this to get there most definitely i mean it's a matter of perspective and focus you know one of the most poignant cliches that will stick with me for life is um the world does not get by on excuses it gets by on solutions Mm. You know, so you've got to be a solution minded individual. Anybody can get stuck on the problem. Oh, I can't do this because of that. Well, what's the solution? You know, find the solution to that. And that's how you succeed. And the people that are solution minded are the ones that succeed. Yeah. And and as that kind of relates to the business of dog training, it's like it's. It, it takes a very, uh, I feel like, abstract mind to, to come between an owner and their pet, which is this member of their family that cannot articulate to them what is wrong or what is right in the right. world. And, and to try to give that being the space to express that kind of thing to you. And then to now be the translator between that member of the family and this member of the family about what needs to happen to make this loving union work or for there to need to be a change. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, it's a matter of clear communication on, on both sides. You know, the dog needs to understand what's expected. And the human needs to understand how dogs learn and that they just don't know what it is that you want them to do. They don't know that they're only supposed to go outside. They don't know that a Gucci handbag is different than a piece of raw leather chew on. Yeah. You know, and and we put these dogs in situations where they get themselves into trouble because they just have too much freedom and not enough direction. Mm. What was the first time you raised a dog? Uh all on your own and had the experience to train them from scratch uh when i was in my early 20s i got my first dogs with my uh, girlfriend caroline um i got jaime and lucy a a pug boston (laughs) and a boston terrier 
<laughs> two little mugsies. Dude, uh, pugs are the weirdest looking animal. <laughs> exactly. They're such snotty. Uh, it's so weird to think that the way that we've um, we've developed dogs to be what they are. Like that. <laughs> that is the emperor's lap dog, the smelliest, snottiest, wrinkliest little animal. But it's just so lovable. It's so endearing. It is. It's mind-boggling from a genetic perspective how <laughs> we we specifically breed. Uh, you know, g- genetic defects. Yeah. Really, you know, for money. Like, that is like brachiocephalic. It's, it's a syndrome that is a malformation in the nasal cavity, but it looks cute on dogs. <laughs> you know, so like, you know, it's kind of like how when, you know, if a child's born with like a cleft palate or something like that, or, or yeah. dwarfism, you know, like you see these mini breeds, those are all dwarves of the litter so they'll take the smallest they'll take the runt of every uh, of each litter and then they'll breed runts and then in their litter they're going to have even smaller going to have an even smaller runt and then they just keep breeding down and down and down so for example a pug is actually a bull mastiff there is no fucking way absolutely well it's a mastiff yeah yeah so it's bred down to be that small it's a dwarf it's a a, a mastiff with dwarfism. And basically. how many generations does it take for a dog to end up in that kind of size? Oh, that's a good question. I would guess at least, gosh, five to ten. I'm not sure. I've never yeah. tested that far. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, we've we've ended up with all these dog breeds, and we all just look around, and you know them from aesthetics. But to have that kind of, uh, you know, look back in time to th- say that this mastiff, you know, this waist high, you know, 120 pound behemoth, and that pug, 200 pounds, 200 pounds? some of them, yeah, yeah, 220. Gee, and you specialize in, in larger dogs, right? No, I take all breeds, you know, as long as they're cognitively sound and they can, you know, process information and, and want to work for a reward system, they can be trained. That's. That's a great thing for people to hear. It's like if, if you can learn your dog's love language, the reward system, the thing that they value themselves, you can learn them to participate in your life in a way that you can both manage and live happier alongside of each other. Most definitely. A lot of a lot of guys are so punishment oriented. They're so quick to correct the dog, tell them what they did wrong, you know, shock them, yank them, leash correct them, make a loud noise or whatever. When the dog doesn't understand what it is they're supposed to do. You know, I saw a guy on um, you know, on, on one of the social medias, he's trying to deal with this dog and he's got a tennis racket that he's, you know, he's, he's trying to protect himself from from getting bit. Mm-hmm. And then he's noosing the dog up on a on a slip lead so the dog's being choked on a muzzle and then he's got a tennis racket and somehow in this dynamic he's going to win this dog's trust and get the dog to want to work for it you know a lot of times what happens is they take so much of the dog's air the dog just becomes lightheaded and passive because they don't want to you know pass out so they kind of just like shut down and be still and don't move it's called learned helplessness Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the dog's being trained or we're teaching the dog to feel differently about people coming in now the dog's going to be scared of tennis rackets you know what if we adopt him out to a home and the kids play tennis and you know they see a tennis racket and they get all aggressive and freaked out because of the negative association of what you know tennis rackets mean yeah so what an interesting thing to have to train dogs in a way that they can be free to live their next chapter of their life without having these visual triggers or these these emotional pulls towards aggressiveness that the only way that you got around is by asphyxiating them and that can, <laughs> right. yeah it's like that's that's beyond <laughs> fucked so so with raising your first dog did you know that you had this inclination this ability to um empathize with the animal and uh, understand its reward system and try to get to behave that way or was it after your first dogs that you found that? Well, my first dogs as an adult were not my first dog. So I, my first dog uh, was, I was two years old and my grandma got me a, a pit bull boxer mix <laughs> because I had ADHD. I was driving her nuts. I was like, you know, full tent, full tilt, Dennis the Menace, just all over camp, rah, you know, all over, couldn't stop. So she gets me a dog. And um, I wasn't around any other kids. I was adopted. I was an only child, so I had no other children to play with. Mm -hmm. So it was just me and Mike. It was just me and this boxer, uh, mixed breed, every day, 
all day long. <laughs> Lived with them. We ate. We slept together. We would fight. I would take my cousin's hockey uniform, his gear on, and we would just full on fight. And he'd be biting the thing and just go, Argh, you know. But he knew it was a game. It was just a big game between yeah. us. But in that time, I got to bond with the dog on a very primal level, you know, before I could speak. Really, I was learning the language of body language and just connecting with mutual trust and, and understanding. And then I just took that from there. My grandma was into dog training, so she gave me, she had this little book, Joel Silverman's Hollywood Dog Training book that I would follow, uh, you know, positive reinforcement training, learning how to use a food lure to lure them into the behaviors that you want to teach them and yeah. just making it a fun, positive thing to where the dog's working for a reward system, not just trying to avoid uh, punishment. So you're two when you get the dog. When are you given this book? How old are you when you get the book? Oh, that was later, probably okay. maybe like... Uh, I would say maybe eight, nine, ten, something like that. But still, this is like one of the first like adult pieces of literature you're probably reading as a kid. This is like a uh, Hollywood dog training <laughs> book. Like that's that's pretty iconic for where you ended up with it. Yeah, it was pretty wild. It, it happened organically, mm. you know. But it was full circle. I never thought about being a dog trainer. Um, I was actually into music and um, you know growing weed. Believe it or not. And that's kind of what steered me into uh, dog training because we were kind of on the, on the cusp of everything becoming legal. And I was working for a, a um, caregiver, a licensed caregiver, to where we had a certain amount of plants that we were allowed to grow for different patients. And cool. we had all of their licenses on the wall and that. But to be able to provide the need, we had to have more plants than we were legally allowed to have. Mm hmm because we had everything in stages. We had our flowering room, we had our vegetative room, and our cloning room. Is that like and, a hydroponic setup, like all yeah. indoor? And Yeah, yeah. so and I got in trouble for that. That's It's so interesting now that it's like there's going to be a labor shortage for experts in this field. As it, you know, I think this year they're talking about federal legalization. I, I doubt that will happen in this election cycle, but the fact that it's continually coming up on the ballot and we're starting to see ourselves in a situation where we have oh, close to 50% of the states with either medicinal or recreational. Most of the experts, the folks that are trained to do this, the folks that have been in this business for passionate reasons for 20, 30 plus years, are incarcerated. <laughs> and it's like, how are you not going to let these people come out and resume the work that they poured so much time and love into? It's like, I get that there was a stigma before you're worried about drug trafficking, mm -hmm. but now we're talking about the medicinal benefits of a plant that is older than our ancestors. It's right. been here for so long. <laughs> and, and the folks that are the early adopters of the industry are still plagued by the felonies that are on their record, and then you're letting big business come into this. It's like, that's disturbing. That's the American way in just about every <laughs> facet. You <know>? Fuck! <laughs> you know, the guy that invents it is the one that pays with his life and does not normally die a rich man. Yeah. He gives everything that he has. Like Nikolai Tesla, you know, died impoverished. You know, so the people that really you know, pioneer the thing, like the guy that founded, uh, you know, FedEx, he bought all these planes and put all this money into it, I mean, invested so much money to where he couldn't afford it and had to sell it. And then the person that bought it, bought something that's already up and running, already existing, and then yeah. they could just refine it down to FedEx instead of Federal Express. And now it's this, you know, huge conglomerate. But yeah, I, I learned something in college of just like, the, the people who break into what you call like a blue ocean strategy, where you have no competition, you're the first one to be doing this thing. Mm -hmm. First one there uh, is going to quickly be surpassed, surpassed profit wise by number two to get there because <laughs> right. all the groundwork is being laid by someone that didn't have the backing necessarily to do it. And it's like that's that's a painful thought. Um, did you find that the raising and caring of plants is similar to what you've gone through with dogs? Yeah, it was actually, you know, very therapeutic for me because it kind of give it gave me the opportunity to nurture and care and, and, and care for something and, and grow something from the very beginning to the very, you know, fruits mm -hmm. uh, of the whole process. Um, and it kind of put my ego in check because you have to vibe on what the plant needs. It's not about when you want to do it. 
it's about when, when the plant needs this type of nutrition or when the water needs to be changed or when the climate needs to be changed or when you got to turn the lights back or whatever, you know, it's all a matter of communication with the plants and you got to understand how the plant's feeling. It has to be healthy. If it's, you know, if, if it's missing anything, it will let you know, and you've got to provide that missing need or, or for nurture or, you know, nutrition. Yeah. My, and my, if you don't do that, then you're going to pay you know, for it. My, my wife has a handful of plants and I was talking to my friend Lauren Elise on this show a couple of weeks ago. It's like for folks that can see the difference between their, their plant standing spry and having some life to it, to being limply hanging from its, uh, from its pot. It's like, it's a very interesting nuance to be in tune to. And, and like you're saying, like to, to check your own uh, schedule and pride and ego and I know what's best for this thing versus what it's asking you for is, is such an interesting experience. And also, I've never heard someone describe uh, the plant as bearing fruit, but it really does. It's like these these buds come ready for harvest and then it's time to go through the cycle again and, and they are so giving in that. And it's like if they don't have caretakers that are willing to give to them in the way that they give to the consumers then then the plant is really just a, a vehicle for the capitalistic pursuit that's that's it's low you know it, it's going to be like our carrots they're going to be lacking in nutrients and value it's not going to be this <laughs> wholesome thing you're going to need 50 carrots to get the value of what you would get you know 50 years ago from one carrot right right most yeah. definitely i mean what's good about all the regulations now is it stops contaminants you know cuz sometimes you'll get crops that get mold in there or, um, you know, bug infestations or things like that. And, and growers will just process it anyway because they need the money. Yeah. So then you're putting, you know, contaminated product out there. So it does regulate it to, to that standpoint, but it takes all the fun out of it. You know, they took all the profits, they regulate everything. Yeah. You know, now it's just a commodity, just like anything else. Yeah. Well, and as someone that's enjoyed the plant myself, and as I'm sure you probably do as well, it's like, do you think there's more to being able to watch your plant grow and waiting for the harvest, enjoying that first partaking, the the miracle of what comes from that thing. Like, do you think more folks should be inclined to have a home grow if they want to participate? Then, um, I think it's really up to them. You know, if you have that passion to want to know, but it kind of goes along the same lines as your food. You know, not everybody wants to have to kill a pig to eat bacon. Yeah. You know, they would just rather go to a restaurant. And yeah, that show would make me so sad. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> right. I'm a bitch. I couldn't do that, man. <laughs> I would be a vegan if I had to kill my own food. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> it is. It's a horrible, uh, you know, thing to do. But we just are. We're so into our delusional mindset. You know, we really don't want to know the truth of where our food comes from. And, yeah, you know, well, and if we are. if you had to be that connected to the the process, like, are you okay with the sacrifices made by other things for your consumption? Because if you, if you are okay with that sacrifice, your your gluttony, I think, would definitely come down majorly. It's like people wouldn't overfill their plate and throw out as much food if they knew what the food went through to land on their to plate. The, yeah, yeah, right. And that, that that's some brutality to it. Um, what do you think is with all your experience with dogs, what do you think is the right way to feed your pet? Well, from a training perspective, it's a good idea to make them work for food to where you don't give them a bowl of free kibble. You use the kibble as a reward system for wanted behavior. So my foundational exercise in the morning, we get up, they go potty. When they come back in, I put their kibble in a little treat bag and I take one dog out at a time. And they have to follow me around the house, only eating from my hip, you know, so they orient to the heel, we call it the heel position to where the dog's just right by your side. And that's where I feed them from. Mm -hmm. And that becomes muscle memory to where they learn to just naturally orient there. You know, that becomes home base. Yeah. So you want that to be a habit formed behavior prior to even putting a leash on them. You know, so if they're conditioned to follow a human, cause it's about mindset, what are they thinking about when we're working with them? If we have a dog and we just let him fly out the door and sniff and track and do whatever he wants, then he's acting on his own impulses. And then that becomes a habit form train of thought to where that mindset transfers over into his decision making and other aspects of his life, which makes it very hard to train, you know, like hound dogs. Mm. Can you train my bloodhound to walk perfectly in a heel position? Maybe for a short amount of time. 
Yeah. You know, but the dog's nose is going to go back to the ground because he's compelled to lead. Bloodhounds were not bred to walk like this. You know, they were bred to track and hunt and, you know, do what they were naturally selectively bred to do over the course of hundreds of years. Yeah. So over time, you, you train the dog to be on the hip, pretty much eating from hand as well, which I'd imagine forms a lot of intimacy between the trainer and the dog. Mm-hmm. Um but once you get them past that state of recognizing, okay, this is my, my natural position is to be on the heel, do you still abstain from feeding them that full bowl until you've gotten them to go outside or you put them through their regular routine? Yeah, you want to start phasing the food out. You know, So in the beginning, it's called the acquisition phase. And the acquisition phase is when the dog is working under a constant schedule of a reward system to where they're always getting rewarded for wanted behavior. And this is to create focus, continued focus on a wanted behavior or activity. Because you, know, you want to be able to control where they're looking and what they're thinking about. Once this muscle memory has happened, then you can start phasing the food out, intermittently rewarding throughout the exercise or just rewarding at the end of the exercise. Um, you may have to incorporate a leash or some type of remote collar system to ensure control over the dog in case the dog decides to make its own decision. You have to have some type of safety net in place to make sure he doesn't run away or you know get at somebody or he get at a dog where a dog's not friendly or something like that you know you have to be able to control your dog no matter what so there always has to be that safety net in place once you phase food out then you're working on verbal praise you know and a little bit of affection just to let them know what they're doing is the right thing yeah, yeah. it's one thing that i always not that not that I always think about, but in my adult life, I've I've noticed more and thought more about. It. It's like our pets are very loving members of our family. They're there for the emotional support. They greet you at the door a lot of the time. You can play together, but at some point in time, they're kind of this underutilized member of the household. And you need to find things to ask of your pet so that you can reward them, but also you get the mutually beneficial relationship that they bring something to the space. Oh, absolutely. I mean, before the Industrial Revolution, every dog had a job. You yeah. know, they were a working member of the family, whether they were herding livestock or, you know, service work or, um, you know, just being little household guard dogs, you know, something of that nature. They all provided a service for, for humans. And now everybody's so busy, they're left at home a lot of the time by themselves and they don't have positive outlets for what they were bred to do. I've seen so many like herding dogs, you know, Queensland healers and Australian shepherds, border collies, German shepherds, um, where they get into households where they have this working mentality. They're very busy minded dogs, you know, you know, they just need something to do yeah. and they don't have anything to do. So they're going to destroy something because that's the only thing that's in front of them. Yeah. You know, so I'm a firm believer in giving dogs a positive outlet for what they were bred to do. So there's all kinds of dog sports that, you know, people can do with their dogs or different, um, you know, training classes they can take just to keep, get the dogs out and stimulate it. So they're more relaxed in the home. Yeah. But if, what a fascinating thing to say, it's like this a being that that needs the same fulfillment that that you and I do the things that we long to accomplish in our life even though the dog can't necessarily express that to you it wants to do something for the household you know that's why when your dog goes out in the yard and thinks about killing a squirrel <laughs> it imagines that's doing something good for the family when it does that it's like uh, it's not that it loves to kill it's that it loves to participate in the betterment of the situation that it's in like anyone else and it, it makes me wonder it's like is it selfish of us to, to have a dog that sits in the house as this luxury item when they are a being that, that craves a life well-lived. Oh, absolutely. I mean, most people get dogs for their own self. They're not necessarily thinking, is this for the betterment of the dog? They're getting dogs as status symbols, you know, to show off, look at my Frenchie or, you know, look at my little teacup chihuahua and things yeah. like that, you know, carrying the dog around all the time, you know, not that they don't love those dogs, but it's a matter of, you know, what are we reinforcing? You know, a lot of those little pocket dogs are <laughs> aggressive because they don't get a chance to walk on their own, you know? So if you're carrying them around all the time and they are not allowed to walk on their own four paws, then that creates a sense of codependency and over bonded to where they don't know how to function like normal dogs because they feel vulnerable or, or, you know, scared when they're on the ground and all they want to do is get picked back up again. Yeah. You know, so it can be detrimental to the psyche of the dog if we, you know, how we care for them. 
And in, in what ways would you recommend that folks that have dogs that are living these very stagnant, sit at home, wait till you get back from work, what ways would you recommend people engage their dogs outside of the very simple things of going going for a walk or chasing the ball? Well, there's you know there's dog walkers, there's daycare play groups, you know, where they can go uh, to some place for a day, <clears throat> you know, while their owners are at work. I used to, when I was doing my daycare thing in Arizona, I had a lot of nurses and doctors that would work, you know, 12 hour shifts or sometimes, you know, around the clock to where I would care for their dogs while they were away. So the dogs had something to do. And a lot of these places will have, you know, either play groups or they'll take them on walks or some, some places in Arizona, they would ride them on bikes or skateboards, you know, just to give them something to do. Yeah. Uh, and they're much more relaxed in the home once they, once they get back. Yeah, dude, it, it's a sick pleasure of mine to watch a bulldog ride a skateboard, but that shit brings me crazy. Dude, that, it fucks <laughs> with my head. I'm like, this is the lowest center of gravity you'll ever get on that board. I, I also love like the, it's the aesthetic of laziness that you see, like the joy on the dog's face that doesn't have to walk, but it can go that fast. <laughs> you know what I mean? It blows my mind how they figure it out, you know, how they know how to propel themselves and how they know how to you know, <laughs> balance and, and lean to steer. They, just, they get so comfy on that thing. I mean, uh, my, my godfather, my, my cousin had a, a bulldog named Babe when, when I was growing up that this was his pride and joy. But seeing how obsessive those dogs are in particular, like this dog had a sickness about a Kong. Oh, you know, yeah. if you would throw a Kong at a couch like that, it would, within 10 yards, get it 25 miles an hour and go face first <laughs> in that couch because it just knew the game was get to as fast as possible. It didn't give a fuck about breaking its own head doing it. Right, right. It's like, that's, that's a disturbing thing to see the want in these dogs' eyes. That's prey drive that can be transferred over to objects but it's an obsessive compulsive train of thought you know a lot of hound dogs have it a lot of terriers have it you know we call them ball dogs to mm. where they're just ball 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 all they care about is ball and nothing else exists in the world except for that ball you know and then you can transfer that over into whatever you want to teach them yeah you know, those make good detection dogs if they can sniff out their ball then we just pair the scent of what we're trying to teach them to find with the ball and then in their mind they're looking for their ball that smells like explosives or narcotics or low blood sugar you know whatever you want to teach them to detect yeah. for some reason that just gave me the visual of like imagine a bulldog that's like a canine unit but like with a fat cop as well <laughs> so it's just like the stereotypical couple just like kind of wilding up like <laughs> I know there's something going wrong here. <laughs> so, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> that, I know they got bacon somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that, that the dog upstairs that has the uh, the ACL tear. Mm -hmm. She is a fiend for for a ball. Like the other day, I'm I'm sitting there with her, and uh, one of my my good buddies, John. He is he's gone through the experience of having a dog with Cushing's disease, and kind of just the way that it's degenerating on the the ligaments and the tendons and whatnot. Uh, he's like, so just spend the quality time with the dog and know that that dog will live as long as it can live for you. But there is a merciful time to help that dog go on to the next chapter of things. Mm -hmm. But I just want to spend some quality time with her. So I'm sitting by this little dog bed she's in and I'm tossing the ball for her and she can't fucking stand. But I'm watching her go Olympic level athlete, just grabbing at this <laughs> thing, grabbing this ball out of the air. I'm like good to know you're still fucking crazy like yeah. that's awesome nothing's changed here <laughs> so the quality the quality of life is still there you know yeah. she's still experiencing some type of joy you, know, you can just play tug with her she didn't have to you yeah know, move around too much but yeah that, that's a good point just like it's it's not just the moments of do they look like they're happy it's like engaging them in ways where they still fear feel the the um, the joys of life and participating in it not just being around it yeah, sometimes we keep them around for our own self, you know, and, and it's delaying the inevitable. Yeah. You know, I've seen ladies where their dogs have, you know, cancer and they'll spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on all of this dialysis and, and whatever it is that they're trying to do, chemo and that. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have to put the dog down. Yeah. You know. Cancer is one of those odd things, too, that like I'm... It, as I'm getting older, my, my wife's a nurse, I'm, I'm learning more about it from a very uneducated perspective of what it is. But it's like every cell that makes up our body has two options. It it dies or, it, you know, regenerates and it multiplies. And then in a lot of instances, once these things reach 
uh, that that natural end or to move on phase. Like you get some that go rogue. You get these cancerous cells that just pop up in your body. Like I never understood that. Um, you know, stage one means it's localized to what you're calling it. If it's stage one pancreatic cancer, then it's just in the pancreas. Mm -hmm. Stage four means it's it's gone everywhere. Which I thought it was a severity of that spot. Oh. Uh, but it, it's just a, a weird question of how much do we outlive uh, the natural aspects of the body? You know, whether it's our pets, whether it's us as individuals reaching, you know, I, I would love to be 125, but it doesn't seem like you get there very gracefully. And I would wonder what kind of body you get to have at 125 years of age, you know? Oh, I don't know if I'd want to be around then. I don't know. <laughs> I, I could be like a bulldog, just happily going downhill, just kind of turning my chair. You know? <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it's a weird thing to say, like, where we... And, and I was talking to my cousin about this. He's like, when you turn 40, that's when the body starts going downhill and that's when you get all this occurrence of the traumas in your life kind of appearing. Things that you could have put off for a lifetime now to start to kind of surface. Yeah. Because it's it's the natural ending part of the life cycle. Versus now with, with our modern technology and, and the way that we can sustain ourselves. You're going to double that number pretty easily if you do well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's when it all starts to surface. It's like you wonder what is the truly natural length of a lifetime for a human being versus what is us pushing the limits of the thing. <laughs> well, I mean, from what I understand, you know, Asian cultures, they've been living into their hundreds for thousands of years, you know, so I think it's... That's a, absurd. <laughs> yeah. You know, like Buddhists and, and, you know, just different Asian cultures, they've always been living long. So it's a, it's a matter of lifestyle, mm. I think, you know, but uh, from a life and end perspective I, I would imagine around a hundred would be like around the average for like an old good old age yeah you know, life i've always so. seen that that triple digit as the the number to aim for but as i i get into my my later 20s i, I question what is um what is the natural course of things it's like again like i like to live a long life but i'd really like to know what is uh the most um the most efficient side of the body, you know, and like what really makes sense for it in that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think ideally it's, you know, everything still works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The moment yeah. you start getting replacement parts, that's when we start having issues. <laughs> right. You know, when you can't walk anymore, you start losing your sight or you can't, you know, hold it, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, come into play. And it's just a matter of how much do you want to deal with until the final thing yeah absolutely one thing you talked about with with dogs i thought really relates to, uh, to people and like things we should be more of aware of in ourselves. it's like in the way that you train the reward system of your pet to get desired behavior to have the wherewithal to do the same thing with yourself is a very difficult but necessary thing it's like i, I had a problem with with pot for a while where i was reaching for my reward system many times a day you know and that wasn't because i earned it it wasn't because it fulfilled desired behavior i thought it would enable better outcomes of things and in some ways i, I do think that plan is capable mm -hmm. of those things but in the same way where it's like a decadent meal feels like something that we tell ourselves we need three times a day when it's like did you earn it one time today you <laughs> right. know did you did you engage the body in a way that it needed more fuel at any point today or did you just lethargically go about your day and eat three times because your body gave a little bit of an emotional trigger of, oh, it'd be nice to eat right now, and, and you just went for the path of least resistance in this? Versus saying, oh, before my dinner, you know, I like to work up an appetite, and I like to go to the gym and do something with myself. You know, to ask these things of your body before you just have your reward system be in control of your actions rather than uh, being the, the preposites precipice for your reward well yeah i mean there's you know obviously a difference between eating just because food tastes good and then eating for sustenance mm. you know and that's the the fine line that we have to differentiate because eating makes us feel good and in some ways it can be like a drug where people look to eat just the way they would look to get high or do anything that's going to alter their their mental state to feel better about themselves Hmm. You know, so, you know, from that standpoint, it's about how many calories are we burning per day compared to how many calories are we taking in and are we gaining weight? Mm -hmm. Are we just getting heavier and heavier? Or are we staying at a healthy weight and are we staying fit? 
yeah. you know, lifestyle is huge. And are we putting things in the body that are meaningful to what we want to do with the body as well? It's like, you know, it's it's not just counting numbers. It's about considering what you do with this thing. It's like, if you're an ophthalmologist, well, you better eat some stuff with the vitamins you need to keep those eyes healthy. Because you can't be over here telling people, like, you're going blind while you can't see dick. You know, like, <laughs> right. it's, it's pretty sad when that's the case. Absolutely. Most uh, definitely. When you were traveling with the dead, what's a normal diet look like for someone that's within these camps? Oh, that is really a matter of the individual. So there's a lot of vegans, hardcore vegans on tour. So they would just eat strictly, you know, good, healthy food. Yeah. Um, and then there would be the rest of us that just survived <laughs> off of grilled cheese and fast exactly, food. I think that exactly what I was thinking about was grilled cheese. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, how many of those can you eat while you're traveling for a year with the a dead? A lot. You can live off of them for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so the folks that are living a very stringent vegan diet, are they in a particular part of the camp where someone's going out to a farmer's market and great, getting great ingredients for this? Or, well, they would just be one. Of, they would have their own station on Shakedown, mm. you know, and everybody kind of brings their own wares and they sell whatever they want to sell, you know, whether it's jewelry or clothes. Um, I met one couple that would go to Tibet and they would buy all of this really cool clothing from tibetan people and then they would fly it back and they would sell it on tour and they had like some of the coolest clothes there yeah you know so everybody kind of has their own niche you know and it's so interesting to see like the the economy that's been developed in there and how you do have folks who take the low-hanging fruit of just like okay i sell bracelets that i make out the car and i buy the cheapest materials and that's enough for people you know it's enough to uh, encourage the lifestyle they want to live versus someone said outside of tour I want to take the adventure of a lifetime I want to keep going back to Tibet and picking out things I love and curating this culture about it and then sharing that with the people that come to these shows yeah, that was the most beautiful aspect of it like the real hardcore heads yeah that lived on tour like that was their life and they had their family on tour they would have children on tour they would raise children on tour you know, it's where you'd see these newborns or these little kids running around, Yeah. you know, and they were just, you know, homeschooled or, you know, just on the road. And then, um, they would have these rainbow gatherings that it was just, just strictly, it was kind of like uh, burning man without all of the crazy stuff. You know, it was just a whole bunch of hippies that would go out somewhere in a big plot of land and just have this, just live until the next tour came. Man, I would love to see uh, a handful of the kids that grew up on the tours sitting down and reminiscing what it's like to be, you know, uh, a young teenager down to five, six years old and what you're seeing and what you're experiencing <laughs> that. Because some people mm -hmm. would imagine that it is, uh, it is very debaucherous, but I would say those kids were probably guarded from that at least to the extent that their parents could. And it really just does look like this open loving society of strangers that became family and family that became strangers as you kind of moved out of regular lifestyles and into what this is i mean as with anything there's a good and evil side so there were your hardcore purists that were almost like religious devout about it you know they were not into the like the heathenistic the drugs and all that stuff but then there were people that were you know so that kind of that culture it was an embodiment of everything you know it was really a matter of what you focus on you know, you can feed the dark wolf or you could feed the light wolf. It's just what you want to pay attention to. Mm. You know, as long as you have a good, healthy support system and everybody around you wants to be healthy, then you're in good shape. Yeah. You know? But if you let drugs take over, which a lot of times, you know, kids would or they would OD just because they have never done it before. You know, and that element is really what kind of shut the dead down. You know, back in the, the 90s, they had Operation Dead End where George Bush sent specialized undercover agents that were filthy hippies that had, because before it was like, you always knew an undercover because they were clean. You know, you just don't buy from anybody that, uh, that smells good. Yeah. You know, if, the, if they're dingy and dirty and they got dreads and they look like they've been sleeping on the ground, then, you know, you're safe. Yeah. That not anymore. You know, they had agents that looked just like that. Do you think that was the the dream position for the agents that did this? Like they were like, <laughs> finally, I get to go to some dead shows and do drugs, <laughs> right. dude. That it's it, it's sad to think that like that it was such a, an apparent issue to the, the government at large that you need to send in these people to to bust up a lifestyle that you don't understand. And I I would argue that it's 
it's hard to say what's helping and what's hurting people from the outside. You really need to be in there to experience it. Now, I imagine most of the problems don't occur from the people that travel and tour and stay with the band. It is the folks that are newcomers that look at this as their one opportunity this year to get absolutely fucked. Yeah. Yeah, and end up in a place of no return. And, and those are the folks that just damage the reputation beyond belief. Yeah, it's always the behavior of a few that ruin it for the rest of us, you know, and the, the vending <clears throat> became an issue because now it was like this traveling marketplace that would essentially take business away from the local retail stores if they're coming in, you know, selling food and selling clothes and all that stuff. And you don't need to go to the local places, you know, so they looked at it like it was affecting local economies when they would come in. Um, and just the whole exploitation of it all where people weren't there for the music anymore. You got your predatory aspect because they knew it was a huge marketplace for drugs. So there would be just people that would just come in and with fake drugs just to make money selling fake acid, fake ecstasy. Everything was fake, fake tickets, yeah. you know, knock off shirts. It was just another way to, to exploit that situation. Yeah, I think that's one of the more interesting uh, things to look at as a musician that's trying to do merchandising myself is is the amount of fake apparel that comes about with the the branding of the band on it. It's like it's something that never seemed to bother Jerry or Bobby or any of these guys that really had rights to it. It was just right. part of what went on there. But like, you know, I'm, I'm not at a scale that I would ever go out and see someone selling knockoff Matt Waters T-shirts. <laughs> but if I did. I would be disappointed in, in what's going on there because it's like this yeah. is one of the few opportunities you have to ask your fans to directly support you through uh, in, enjoying the product but also purchasing the product in a way that comes back and sustains what's actually going on there. I think they were so successful that it really didn't matter at that point. Yeah. You know, because they were allowing tapers. You know, you could come in and record anything you wanted and share it for free. Yeah. You know, they weren't really trying to own every little copy of everything. Well, and they really are the first generation of, of bootlegs, and there's never going to be anything like that because there was a taping section, isn't it? Oh, it was unbelievable, the obsessiveness of the culture, you know, being able to record every show, and everybody just listens to it and studies it, and they all have their own special moments. It just affected everyone on such a deep emotional level that I don't think we'll ever see again in our lifetime. I mean, some people compare Taylor Swift, all the Swift heads, to the way the people love the Grateful Dead. I don't know. Dude, I've not seen their calling seen their them show. Swift heads changes everything about it, and it's so fucking funny. <laughs> but I, I will say, I don't think there's the the Dead had uh, a culture that I think is is similar to the the belovedness of Taylor Swift in that culture. But that's more of um, a cult of personality mm -hmm. versus this is like a, a musical indoctrination. We're not going there to see Taylor. You know, people want to see their person in front of them sing the songs that they love. Mm -hmm. Versus when you would go to see the Dag, you were going to be part of the culture at large. It wasn't about what songs were played and about who's necessarily there. It's like, I'm sure there was a huge wave of deadheads that dropped off after we lost Jerry. Yeah. But there is this culture that supersedes without Jerry. Would there ever be anyone at a Taylor Swift concert if Taylor wasn't there in the flesh? <laughs> right. Maybe if it's a good enough AI generation of it, but like, I don't think that's uh, plausible by any sense of it. It's not because she's a solo artist. It's just because the catalog doesn't exist without this one demigod kind of entity, which Jerry definitely is, yeah. but it did continue without it. It really did. That's what makes it so magnificent, you know, is that the train just keeps on going. It's just a different, you know, conglomerate of, of band members. You know, as long as they take that core philosophy of music and don't try to change it, then that's what is going to keep people coming back. Because what was beautiful about the dead is they didn't do the, sh the same show twice. You know, if, if you saw them three nights in a row, you'd be lucky if you heard one song repeated. Yeah. You know, they were that, that vast in their, in their music repertoire. So it always kept it interesting. And then when they did play the same song, they didn't play it the same way. It yeah. was either faster or slower, or they would emphasize different points in the song that weren't emphasized before. And it was just always this constant 
tasty thing that just kept coming. It was just amazing. Yeah, I was talking to uh, my buddy Nick. I think it was on the show, but it may have just been off the record. Where uh, a jam band that he loves, they all have talkbacks. So you can just lean over and say something into the headphones of the other guys. Mm-hmm. And, and I love that kind of like... You know, it's almost like watching fighter pilots up there. It's like <laughs> yep. it's it's a very calculated decision for us to change formation and do this <laughs> thing. But with the dead, it's like there's there's no instruction given. It is just like it's barely even a musical cue. It's more like uh, I'm I'm going this way, guys. We'll see if y'all follow. <laughs> and it might be someone playing in this direction, and everyone else is staying right here. And like it, it's it's interesting to see that there didn't have to be any unity behind these movements. It was just kind of suggestions and suggestions were taken and suggestions are passed on. Yeah, they, it was huge risks, you know, and that's where the magic happens. I mean, sometimes you fall and crumble and, you know, it's got to start all over. And other times it takes you to levels that you didn't even think were possible. Yeah. You know, because everybody is just so vibing together on the same plane of, of energy. And, you know, that is a communication between instruments. You know, so all it really takes is like, you know, a head nod or a moving of the guitar or, you know, the keyboard player to play some type of riff and then everybody just kind of feels and vibes off of that. But everybody has to be open and listening to what everybody else is doing in relation to what they're doing and not be so overly focused on just what they're doing. Yeah. You know? So it becomes this whole group membrane kind of thing, um, which is amazing. Like the fish kind of took that to a whole nother level. Yeah. You know, they were kind of deadheads in the beginning and they took that philosophy, you know, there's different, you know, there's bands out there that take the dead philosophy and then there's bands out there that just want to play exactly like the dead, which is impossible. If you're, if you're impersonating something, some, someone or something, you're bound to come up short because you can't be that thing. It's like you either, um, you, you poorly replicate something or you break a barrier with it and try your own iteration of it. But for the most part, that's what happens with the dead cover band groups, you know, but then there's some that just nail it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Dark Star Orchestra. The guy, the keyboard player that was in Dark Star was now in Dead and Company, you know, so he started out in a dead cover band and now he's in, you know, the dead because he's practicing playing, you know, all that. And then I think the guitar player for um, Dark Star is now playing with Melvin Seals, if I'm not mistaken so it could be kind of like a platform to the next level yeah if you take it seriously because it's kind of like classical music you know if you're looking at a beethoven piece you're going to want to play exactly what's on there in the same with the same instruments and the same tone you want to try to replicate exactly the way it was played and there are some guys that can do that take that science and just you know nail it yeah like a friend of mine um john reuter in arizona he's the head of this guitar making school and he makes Jerry Garcia replica guitars. Nice. And they're exact. He uses the same wood, the same components. <clears throat> so it's literally the exact replica of it's not a cheap or made one. They're like ten, fifteen thousand dollars is what he gets for them. But um a lot of the major dead uh Jerry parts, the players all over the country have his guitar. It's John Reuter. Reuter is the is the name but that's badass uh, zach nugent plays one of his guitars and um, yeah yeah how'd you get to know this guy um he played in another dead band called the noodles in arizona great name yeah yeah they're a great great group of guys uh, yeah kim and and john and, and elliot but uh, back in the day it was all the grateful dead family mm. you know so we would just kind of mix and match different band members playing in different configurations of dead cover bands that's awesome did seeing things like that get you inspired to jump into this realm of customizing congas and other instruments and whatnot? Yeah, well, that's just the artist in me. You know, I love the stage presentation, you know, and how things look on stage. Yeah. Just the artistry of it all. And then just being an artist, I thought that would kind of set me apart from other percussionists because there's so many percussionists out there. There's a lot of great guys. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, what can I do that can separate myself from what everybody else is doing? Mm-hmm. You know, so I would come up with these different designs for because I played in this band called the Franchise Band in Arizona. So I would customize the drums for whatever show we were playing. So the this is from an old Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, Can you show that on the camera? We did. Yeah, this is uh, something that I did back in the day. So it's it's just multi-layered. It's got some um, 
vinyl like car wrap material on there that's all hand cut uh, to the form of the drum and then I use some uh, snake skin um, you know synthetic snake skin material just to add to the the vibrancy and the depth of it and you did that for every specialized show that y'all played uh, yeah I did it for three of them <laughs> that's yeah. crazy and you did a full rig yeah the Prince I did the Prince rig <laughs> Did you ever sell any of these, or do you still have all of them? I, they're all the same drum. Oh, no way. Yeah. So you just strip it down and redo it? Yep. That's so cool. You mm-hmm. need to show me some pictures of the Prince rig. I would I would love to see that. Yeah, it's beautiful. I actually got a like from Sheila E and, and, and on Instagram. Didn't you tell me that you might be building something for Sheila at some point? Yes. I'm thinking about making her a pair of customized timbales. That would be... And then gifting them to her. That'd be pretty fucking sweet. Uh, is it just about finding the right timbales to do that with? And Yeah, I'll just use your traditional LP 14 and 15 inch timbales. Yeah. And then I'm just trying to think, you know, play around with different ideas of design. But I got this one design is where it's a New York City. It's going to be the skyline wrapped around the drum that's going to be second Whoa. surface and then lights in there. So the city's going to light up along the skyline. And then along the backdrop is going to be, um, you know, I was thinking about maybe Tito Puente. Uh, different images of him in the clouds, you know, just to commemorate, uh, you know, the love of, of Tito and, 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 you know, such a great loss and inspiration uh, to us all. I know she loves him very much. Yeah. And, and who was the group that you had mentioned to me that you got to jam with in NYC recently? Oh, that was uh, Tito Puente's son, Tito Puente Jr. Cool. Yeah. And, and wh- where did you play it again? Um, at the Palladium in New York City. It's fucking sweet, man. I, I, so I was telling uh, Mike Reeder, who hosts that open jam that you had gone to, and I was like, this guy's going to come down to the open jam. Make sure that everything's set up so we can just come fuck your mind up. You're going to really <laughs> love it, man. And I was like, he just played somewhere sick. I cannot remember the name of it, but it will blow your mind if you ask him. So. Yeah, it was actually quite a blessing. I reached out to him um, on National Sons Day over social media because he's like one of the most famous sons. And I just sent him a, a picture of these timbales that I made. They were a three-dimensional custom fire design that all lit up and that. And he thought they were amazing. And I said, man, I will give these to you if you can, if you'll let me sit in for a song. And he invited me out, out to New York City and got me some free tickets, got me backstage and let me uh let me sit in for one did you get to see him play them oh yeah yeah i got that's, to play with him while he was playing them that's awesome and go to rehearsal and all and, that and have you gotten to see them used for anything else since then have you seen them here yeah he said he's uh, he just shipped them to florida cool. so he's going to use them for a show and uh i'm trying to get him to use them for an ad because he does hot sauce He's got different bottles of hot sauce and yeah. it's fire. You know, it looks like they're on fire. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping he'll use them for something like that. Do you think you'd ever consider making these on like a consignment kind of uh, call, like of taking orders in to customize timbales, or it's more something you like to feel motivated to do and in a very limited amount? It's really a very limited amount because a lot of guys don't need that. You know, they don't need to pay an extra five, six hundred to a thousand dollars to customize their drums because they're already out there getting paid. You know, I do it for the love of the art. Yeah. You know, so where they become more of like artistic pieces as well as instruments. Yeah. Well, they, they look badass in that one picture that you had showed me of, and I, I love the fucking light rig of it. It's like, how'd you say you did that with, with LCDs again? It was like matched to the music to some extent. Well, I took sign making technology and applied it to the drums. So the out the exterior where what the flames are is a, a high impact resistant Lexan that what would normally be just sign letters, you know, mm-hmm. words, and then they're backlit. So we would put LED behind it, which illuminates the Lexan. But you don't necessarily see the, the the bulbs of the LED. You just see the illumination of it. So it kind of brings it to light. And then I just mounted that with like a, a quarter inch spacer around the drum. So it's just set off of the drum shell itself. So you don't see bulbs. You just see the overall. Yes, you just see the illumination of it. So it gives it this three-dimensional effect that is um, unparalleled. Yeah. You know, it just it gives it the visual that you can't match any other way. And, and how'd you get to match up to the music? How'd you get to have like that set kind of like LCD sensor? Oh, well, those are you just buy at Home Depot <clears throat> that they are sensitive to the sound. Cool. You know, and other ones don't necessarily move to the sound. They just flicker. So it might look 
like it's going to the tempo of the song, but it's just lights moving around in whatever time they're sequenced to. Yeah. Well, hopefully it ends up in the hands of Miss Sheila E. We can watch her throw them at some point. And those <laughs> things are just burn in the air. Dude, I, I love watching videos where she starts getting too hot and heavy with and just throws a fucking symbol on them. Like, that's why she's the queen, man. Right? <laughs> oh. If there's anyone that, that made Prince better, it was Sheila E. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, like there was a lot of amazing <laughs> band members. Like anyone that's in the revolution, I get huge respect for everything that they did with Prince. But it's like no one else got brought to the front and left in the front except for Sheila E. Okay, <laughs> she was this permanent institution at that point. It's like she deserved it. She, yeah, she could play too. She could back it up. She oh, was not. she could more than play. I mean, she <laughs> she had the showmanship and the, the character and then all the performance but also this this like un, undefinable star power where some people it's 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 their confidence in the way they carry themselves mm -hmm. the way she played everything was was such ferocity that it was unparalleled <laughs> most absolutely absolutely cuz it's about emotion you know you know letting your who yourself who you are come out in the way that you play and if you've been oppressed in any way or if you don't believe that you can do it then that's going to affect you know your performance yeah but she was brought up from from birth plan, you know, from a child. So all of that was ingrained in her as her mind and body were developing. All of that, all those rhythms and patterns were, you know, being imprinted during yeah. that time. Well, brother, before we start to uh, wrap this thing up, is there anything that you'd like to plug? Oh, uh, just if you guys are looking for a dog trainer, I'm a nationally certified dog trainer. Um, my website is www.zen, Z-E-N-K, letter nine, dot com. So it's zenk9.org. What a great name for a dog training company. What's it Thank like you. to get a national certification on that kind of thing? How, how long is the program and whatnot? Um, you've got to have like 250 hours of working with dogs documented, whether it's doing private lessons or um, working with rescues, you know, like, like a letter of... Um, of documentation from the director of a rescue saying you have like 75 hours working with dogs just you and the dog and then you've got to have around 200 to 250 of one-on-one -on -one working with the client or teaching a group class this is for uh, the CPDT certification so it's a certification council for professional dog trainers and is there a particular style of training that you're interested in doing in this next chapter because you mentioned like the scale of it back in Phoenix was at the point where it was just as much as you could house, but now is kind of a new phase of it. Do you have a particular light that you'd like people to see you as um, an availability for? Uh, I don't. I mean, I like raising puppies. You know, I do a little puppy Montessori program where we potty train them and socialize them and get all the basics down. So we do all the hard work for the owners that just brought a, a young puppy into the home and may not have all the time and energy that it takes to raise a puppy. Yeah. Well, that, that, that sounds like the most glorious place to be where, like, the joy of a puppy is oh, unparalleled. <laughs> uh, and then your Instagram is Papa underscore Chongo? Yes, Papa underscore Chongo for percussion for my music. And then also Zen, uh, Zen Canine underscore training is on Instagram as well for the dog training. Cool. Worth the follow on everything. And then maybe if you're free on Saturday, maybe we can do some jamming. I might have a gig. That'd be a lot of fun. That'd be like oh, uh, you, me, and my uh, my trombone player, Jason. Who's a bad motherfucker? You'll love this dude. Cool, man. Well, you want to jam a little bit on the way out? Sure. Cool. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. My friends, as always, thanks for watching. Uh, it, it means the world. And uh, make sure you follow this man. He is a, a light of many things and, and a true Thank character you. in what you do, man. I, Thank I, you. Thank you th for having me. Thanks for walking so graciously into my life. It's like uh, <laughs> I, I'm sitting there playing my Sunday gig. There's no one in the fucking establishment. And there's just this stranger giving me more than the time of day just <laughs> digging into it. And then it's like, oh, no, we, we were supposed to hang out today. No, that's awesome. <laughs> Hearing like, do you want me to go get this conga? And then we just had a fucking blast playing, man. It's like, right, right. so uh, I'm looking forward to much more of it. Likewise, my friend. It was a pleasure. Thanks, man. <laughs>
Funky as always, my brother. Nice, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Papa Chongo, uh, we will see you soon here on the Weekly Wave. we got some more episodes coming up today, so stick around, players. Peace.